So picture this, you've completed scenario one, and now you're getting into Frosthaven. Finally, you're here. But now that you've gotten here, what do you do? You have several foundations that you need to build. You do have some buildings, but they're all very basic level one. And you have all these options that you have the capacity to build, and now you have limited resources. And not only that, but you want to buy items for your characters. But you're wondering, what can I, what should I do with these? So let's do a rundown of those buildings. Only the buildings that are available on the first week of Frosthaven. Things you can build instantly. We won't be talking about things that we'll be unlocking further through the campaign for when your characters retire, or things that will unlock as you um, do events and whatnot throughout the city. Just things that are available immediately. As a result, there will be spoilers. There will be spoilers, but the only things will be available are things on week one. So if you want to make an informed decision instead of like, hey, this hunting lodge looks cool. How does it work? I'm going to do a rundown here of what the buildings do at their basic level one level or level two level if it's something you can upgrade. And then uh, just do a rundown of what reward can it be and what are good strategies for advancing it for your party. As per usual, be sure to like and subscribe. It actually really does help. And uh, if you want to support us, please consider joining Patreon. It really does help. The barracks. So the barracks is going to be the first building that seems a little confusing because unlike the other buildings, you can see on the bottom right, it actually doesn't tell you how to upgrade it. There's no upgrade costs. Don't worry. The, up the barracks will be upgraded over the course of the campaign. And it will be something that will be very obvious when you see it. Don't necessarily worry about... Um, trying to run for that upgrade the barracks will eventually you'll eventually find these events and you'll eventually be able to upgrade them but the barracks is actually incredibly powerful but it's kind of weak at the start so notice it does say exclamation point gain four soldiers you do instantly gain four soldiers and you do have a max capacity of four when you do perform defense chance for Frosthaven, uh you have to draw from the town guard deck but the town guard deck might be um kind of weak at the start especially with negatives so if you have like no defense uh chances are the plus zeros and even the negatives are just gonna cause your buildings to suffer damage in addition you've got the wreck card in there which could potentially wreck a building which is sad um but the barracks does allow you to um, potentially reduce the attack amount at the start it's minus five uh every time you burn a soldier and you can burn a soldier multiple times per defense check notice that when you burn soldiers uh for defense checks it is only for one check even if the attack targets multiple buildings and they will uh repeatedly target target multiple buildings but then for that defense check you also get to draw twice uh due to the nature of the deck and not having curses uh, drawing twice actually prevents you from even drawing the wreck card so whenever you burn soldiers on attack it's incredibly useful just because you won't draw the wreck card for that one um but also it does reduce the attack and as you level it up you can store more soldiers in it and uh the advantage doesn't like say you draw three cards or four cards but the amount you reduce that defense check my uh does increase with your barracks level so it gets pretty significant the barracks is something you will want to top off with soldiers. I do consider it a high priority to spend gold and money if you did use soldiers for attacks to restock this as often as possible. You will want several soldiers for when you want you want to have maximum soldiers when winter arrives. Notice the first summer is actually incredibly light. Chances are you won't get attacked during the first summer. But if you do and you do use soldiers, be sure to get them back by winter. Or just don't use them and just recover because the first attack is generally pretty weak. Alchemist. The only benefit you get from Alchemist 1 to 2 is the ability to distill potions, which can help you discover potions, especially if you like brew a potion and you're like, aha, I get it. And then uh, after you distill it, you realize, oh, um, that I don't need this potion. You can distill it, get one herb back. I know it's only one herb. So you lost two herbs to get one back, but you can try again. And that's actually really powerful if you're trying to hunt for that one potion. It does require you to burn herbs to do that. But some t also, because you can always um, return herbs to Frosthaven Supply, unlike, you know, and then people can craft with those and use them. This is kind of way you can, like, grandfather stuff into your future characters. So, although I don't consider this to be something you should maybe go into immediately, I do think this is a mandatory building. Because once you start retiring, you can, like, hey, I'm going to distill all my potions and deposit them to Frosthaven. Oh, hello, next character coming up. And then have them craft some of those potions that you liked. So, not urgent, 
but mandatory later. And the workshop. The workshop doesn't have other upgrades. Keep in mind, by the way, these are building upgrades. So they're done during the construction, step five of the Atlas phase. These are not during done during building operations, phase three. This has been a little bit of confusion, but just wanted to clear that up here. So all of these, there's many barriers throughout the, um, the campaign where you'll need a sled or you'll need a boat, especially once you start to get, get to the sea, uh, which will unlock uh, pretty quickly after the the tutorial area and it opens the whole world up uh you'll be able to explore the sea pretty quickly after and you'll quickly discover hey i need a boat i should build a boat now the boat's useful and it unlocks um the boat sled and uh climbing gear all unlock just forms of transportation so just like the other buildings they all give you prosperity which is great they also give you some uh, fun text to go with and potentially unlock other events you will not be able to complete the campaign without all three of these so i personally don't consider these a priority until you see a scenario that you want to uh continue down that line but even then like if you're like hey we unlocked this x scenario but it needs a sled you can always just go back that outpost phase uh do one two three four five and then during step five build a sled when you go back out to do scenarios you'll be able to continue that chain. So you can always just wait until you need it. And that's fine. These these are buildings that you don't start with. You have foundations, you could potentially build them. And there are four of these. The hunting lodge, the mining camp, the logging camp, and the walls. So let's talk about the walls. Walls are simultaneously incredibly important and not important at the same time. Walls are very important because you need them for winter. But because there's so few attacks during summer one, that this you don't really need to urgently build the walls up immediately it's something that you should do but it's not urgent so this is something you can hold off additionally walls do not grant prosperity it's the only building in the game as a matter of fact there's also no event card or anything to go with it it'll just say plus five defense with an exclamation point it'll just increase it and add it to your campaign sheet it's a little boring no prosperity no event text you just do it and that's okay because you will need those numbers. So the next three buildings are all incredibly similar. Um, I'm gonna go over the mechanics of them first all, all at once, and then we'll go to them like one at a time. But all, all three of these buildings involve the same thing where during your building operations step, you can burn two gold to turn that two gold into one resource. I consider these to be incredibly powerful first build options because especially like lumber, Lumber is something you need uh, a large amount of to build other buildings. And additionally, some of the items you want might require that. So uh, the fact that you might want a large amount of lumber. So you, you, you need lumber to build buildings. You need lumber to craft items. And this is just the best way to get it. But like you'll need metal and hide as well. So you can just get these. But plus they also involve like adding events to your calendar and they all give you plus one prosperity. So if you didn't like any of those first options, these are great. Additionally, the hunting lodge is special because the first level of prosperity unlocks a class for you, which is cool. Uh, and this is something you'll notice throughout the campaign. Certain buildings will draw certain classes to Frosthaven. I consider that to be just a cool thing because uh, just, just having the ability to like, hey, I built a hunting lodge here. And then in the coming week, uh, a per new person has arrived and they're interested in helping you out. And just seeing as you build a Frost Haven, how this changes. Of course, during the campaign, just doing campaign events and those scenarios will uh, unlock and add new classes to Frost Haven. But sometimes buildings will do that. And that's something cool. I'm not going to spoil what other buildings do because we're just going over prosperity one, week one. What can you do? But all the buildings do the same thing turn two gold into one of that resource. And obviously the hunting lodge is fur, the mining camp is um, metal, and you get wood from the logging camp, as one might guess. The craftsman. The craftsman gives you items one through 10, and when you upgrade it, it gives you items 11 through 15. Note that the, pro the all buildings give you plus one prosperity. So upgrading a craftsman at the very least gives you prosperity, but it also unlocks uh, certain items, some of which I consider incredibly powerful. I consider Craftsman going from level 1 to level 2 one of the very easy choices for a uh, first pick for your uh, first outpost phase. I don't consider it mandatory, but if you do have like a um, Banner Spear or a Drifter, it does offer some of the heavier items uh, instantly that uh, will help you. So, But let's first go over the items 1 through 10, and we'll see exactly what the Craftsman offers you. 
I had one Spyglass. It's a head slot that gives you a... It should be very similar. It's like Eagle Eye Goggles, but instead of for an attack action, it's just for a single attack. Honestly, for a lot of people, this is probably going to be very similar, because unless you're like a Spellweaver, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the times you'll be performing single attacks. However, because having advantage on multiple attacks, especially once you get to like three or more, like for like the Banner Spear or whatnot, uh, the Spyglass uh, becomes much worse than the Eagle Eye Goggles. However, it's very easy to craft. You just need metal and it gives you advantage. Uh, it does take up a precious head slot, but at this point in the game, you actually don't have many head slots. Although there is are potentially some uh, items you could have purchased with gold before you got into Frost Haven that might be taking up that slot for you. The Spyglass is definitely one of the good options. This is something that's available without having to upgrade uh, the Craftsman. So we're going to go over the ones that you can get without upgrading, and then we'll actually talk about the ones you can get from upgrading it once. So remember, we're going only over buildings that you you can build immediately on the first week and just a rundown of what your options can be and then you'll have a more informed decision so let's go over item two crude helmet it's like iron helmet but plus one instead of plus zero crude helmet's a really good option just because uh especially especially algox by now you have completed the first uh, thing and realized algox archers and algox guards are brutal they hit hard uh so when they crit it basically means you have to lose a card. Like a lot of those like, hey, here's an attack four, congratulations, eight damage. No level one's gonna be taking eight damage, you're losing a card. However, five damage is something you can definitely take. So if you're not going for Spyglass and you're like at the front of the party, especially like a Banner Spear, this is an incredibly good option as well. Um, I, I strongly suggest any of the frontline characters to take this even though it is worse than the Iron Helmet. Notice you can also upgrade these items later. Traveling Cloak. Plus one hit points. Anyone can use it. It's really good. It only costs one hide. This is something any character should be able to use if, if you haven't used your chest slot yet. Now, of course, Bone Shapers could really use this because you do, if you have drop uh, skeleton one, two, and three, that's six damage. Your health is only six at level one. This could be that seventh health that you need. However, a lot of people are probably going to be leaning on Warden's Robes. But if you didn't take the ro Warden's Robes, this is a very easy pick for any Bone Shaper. But any class can just benefit from this. It's easy to use, it's easy to craft, and you can always just sell it back for two gold. Crude Hide Armor. Now, of course, this does give you a minus one, so you have to be able to wear heavy items to equip it. But um, uh, for the next two attacks against you, uh, they suffer disadvantage, and every time you long rest, you get it back. That's actually incredibly powerful. Uh, this should sound familiar to the leather armor from the digital version. So congrats, we actually have it, although worse because it does give you a minus one. But if assuming that you uh, have that thing, and I would not take this in, unless you have that perk because even two points of disadvantage is great, but throwing another minus one uh, will hamper your over the course of it. I'm not saying don't take it if you do, but it's something there's just generally better options to do with your resources or just save it up. Uh, however, if you do have the perk, this is a, definitely a viable thing, especially if you aren't going for uh, the heavier items that you can get from the Craftsman level two, um, because you're going for other buildings, and that's very valuable as well. It's it's a good it's a good item. Crude boots plus one move on during a move. Long rest to get it back. Not much to go over here. It's worse than the booster striding, but the boots of striding is something we're probably not going to be seeing in games going forward. They were too powerful, and this is just a worse version of it. But it's still very good. We clearly saw this in Jaws of the Lion, where uh, the crude boots kind of took over. And this is a good item. Anyone should take it. Um, it's fantastic. Flexible slippers. So this is slightly different. Um, uh, tap tap when you end your turn to instead of looting uh, the hex you're on, loot a different hex instead. Uh, this is actually really powerful because there's a lot of times where you just kill an enemy in melee and then they're dead next to you. And you don't want to be like, well, I want to loot it, but my loot card's in my discard and I don't want to spend one move next turn to loot it. You can always just tap it and pick it up. This ends up being a very potent card. Flexible slippers is fantastic. Uh, I do think that if you don't bring a loot card, this is actually a pretty good alternative. Something I found that was annoying, like with the Geminate and sometimes the Drifter, if I wasn't like using Violent Inheritance well, is the flexible slippers really helps if you like bonk them in melee and then need to scoop it up. It really does go a long way. I, I, I think that if you don't have the wing boots uh, from purchasing gold at the start or the crude boots, this is an incredibly good option because it, it will help you collect the rest of the resources that you do really need. Item seven, crude bow. Uh, this is only good for range attacks, but you do have plenty of range attacks. The Drifter, the Banner Spear have good range attacks. Uh, half the Geminate cards that are attacks are ranged. Uh, Bone Shaper, Death, I mean, there's, there's so many. Death Walker, less as much because more of your attacks. Uh, 
rely on where proximity to shadows and this uh usually i don't think there's actually any death walker cards that say perform a ranged attack where it x is within range of a shadow it's usually just perform a melee attack as if you were occupying the shadow hex or target all adjacent so on and so forth but i think for basically any class this is a good way to just increase range from one ranged attack um it's hard to complain about you get it back every long rest um do note that the gemini it does kind of oh yeah do note that it's not actually that useful with the gemini because uh, it's the, the restrictions don't change with it. So if it says they must be at range three or four, it doesn't change to four or five. So be warned. Code Spear. So um, instead of being able to perform a melee attack in melee, you can target someone two hexes away. I do think this is just a good option. It just and gives you reach, literally, um, to be able to target enemies. Given that there's a lot more terrain types in this, uh, this is one that I found to be immensely useful. If you're not using a shield, this one goes a long way, especially if you're like, uh, having issues with mobility or like enemies like in annoying situations not only that but there's like a lot of times scenario design where they like put ranged enemies behind boulders so being able to like at least tap them especially if you have the ability to like drop a wound attack on them from afar or something or crowd control like disarm but like or, or, or some sort of crowd control effect I think that can go a long way this is a this is a strong card protective scepter is actually a really great card and I think it's a little bit undervalued but uh um, it does cost two resources but it's one handed and you recover it every time you long rest but you can give one ally shield one I do think this is actually really profound with the bone shaper because a lot of times like three health is not enough to get by but four can sometimes if they take three damage and then they have to take another hit can go a long way also stacking this with like a banner spear who has shield can sometimes render a bunch of attacks on them um useless for a bit so if you have like particularly tanky things or weak things that you want to take have them take another hit this goes a long way and last but not least crude shield crude shield just says hey you took a negative condition tap this to remove it it does give you a minus one unless you uh, have the ignore uh, negative items perk so this one's actually really strong. There's a, another shield we're going to feel over shortly that's a little bit better, but this one's pretty great. Uh, just prevent one thing, one scenario. Once per scenario, stop a status effect. It's strong, but I don't lean that hard into this because I consider the other item to be that much more superior, and you probably have other handed options that are better than this. So now we're going to get into items. If you actually don't want to see the items that unlock from me on Lock Craftsman, go to the next bookmark. We'll actually resume talking about buildings uh, after this. I know the Craftsman takes up a lot of time to talk about, but ultimately talking about all the items I think is important to discussing what items you will have available and so you can make an informed decision. So let's talk about those items that you can craft if you upgrade your Craftsman at Prosperity Level 1. Item 11, Simple Charm. This one's actually really strong. Just remove a minus one from your deck. That's uh, it improves your reliability and the fact that it doesn't replace it It's just straight up remove a minus one. I think goes a long way even though it's only one minus one Remember that one of the best perks in the game ever was remove two minus ones from your deck So this is half of that perk at the spent expense of your head slot I do consider and the fact that it's like permanent so you like spy Spyglass you have to like use it and then you have to long rest there are scenarios where you won't be able to long rest this one just constantly has an effect where you will reliably draw the less minus ones less often you know because there'll be one less in your deck you won't be shuffling it in that's really helpful so this one's obviously a strong one especially if you're dealing damage especially if you have large volumes of damage like uh the bone shaper i think some of the bigger attacks um like some of the drifter who can reliably do attack fives might not benefit from this as much but uh the bone shaper where drawing a minus one can often lead to especially against shielded enemies can be the difference between one and zero damage uh I, I think this is an incredibly powerful item and i think that this is one of the reasons why you should upgrade your craftsman crude chain armor now this is one for the uh banner spear and drifter but um if you ha if you have the ignore negative items perk this one is tap uh prev shield two for one attack and not only that but it's not preemptive you can wait until you've drawn the drawn the damage and figure out what it is and then every long rest you can prevent two damage so this effectively kind of turns long rests into uh, valued at four health per instead of two health because you'll be able to stop two points of damage for every rest I do consider this one of the more powerful chess pieces as a result uh, just at low levels and not only that but even as you start to level up this one does kind of do, do, this this does a lot of work and I think it's one of the more uh, potent items and you can get it immediately uh, so once you get that first perk you can get the crew chain armor and then uh, just constantly be dropping two damage from one attack every rest and I think that I think that adds up over the course of a scenario significantly 
Dancing Slippers, after you suffer damage from an attack, do a move too. So this one's something I think is super cool because um, especially when you like have enemies that surround you and then you can like back up and potentially drop attacks. Now, of course, you have to move, which can be good or bad. Sometimes this is exactly something you want to move forward. But it's funny when any, like there's a group of enemies or so two of them are going to get to you. So like the first one gets to you, swings on you, you suffer damage, move two. The next one tries to get to you and now can't because you've performed a move two. Not only that, but you can wait until after you've drawn to see how much damage you took and see where you can position yourself, where you can avoid the, another hit. So this one can add up quite a bit too. And it does take the boot slot, which I, I think is pretty valuable because I really do like great boots, but this can really... This can really go a long way. I know it's conditional though. So um, because it is, I don't value it too much. I think, if, I do think the ability to move to is potent, but the fact you need to do it during a monster turn after you suffer damage from them uh, makes diminishes its value, but it still becomes really strong. You should you should try it out if this is something you think you can uh, do to avoid. I, I personally uh, found this really interesting with the banner spear uh, as a way to, um, after seeing the enemies move, using this on the like second to last enemy to go or last enemy or something, um, just to put myself into positions for formations on the next round. Heavy Sword. This one's boring and amazing. A plus one to one melee attack every time you long rest to get it back. Hard to complain about. Uh, generic plus one attack bonus. It's basically, because it's single melee attack, it's almost a power potion, but uh, you get it back every rest. In some, for some classes, this is better. It does take up a hand, which I uh, I mean, that's, that's honestly, what are you doing with your hand slots anyway? But it does take up a hand slot. But um, if you were just doing single targets anyway, it... Um, it, it, it's very close to just a power potion. Now, of course, if you're attacking multiple times in a round, power potion clearly wins out and takes up a small slot, but uh, I'm not knocking the power potion. But for some classes, this is basically one. You, you're taking this if you're melee. And reinforce shield. So this is take the crude shield and then add one more item to it. And now you get the reinforce shield. Same thing as before, but long rest instead of once a scenario. I do consider this to be a very valuable card. If you are taking a lot of hits or condition, like throwing a lot of negative conditions on you, this is obviously a very easy take for one-handers. So you can see those item cards are pretty valuable. So if you want to unlock those 11 through 15, do it. Um, this is a very easy pick, but obviously some of them require you to like have the ignore items perk to use effectively and some of them uh, may not uh, uh, boost your group as much. So if you think that, hey, we don't need this for our group, our group's doing fine, this is something you could skip, but I do think that plenty of classes could benefit from items 11 through 15. Upgrading a craftsman from 1 to 2 is incredibly strong and always a good option, or building one of the resourcing producers. The resource producers are very valuable, and you don't have a lot to do with your gold at the start beyond build new buildings. And as you upgrade buildings, you'll notice a lot of times upgrading won't have gold costs. So there's just not a lot to do with your gold. So uh, being able to turn it into resource, which you do have lots to do with, um, really does, uh, especially over the course of the campaign, this is something you are going to need. Because at the start, you don't have enough resources, and then you have too much resources, and then later, you do not have enough resources. It goes through this interesting curve, and you're going to want a lot. Even if you think you have a lot, there will be a time where you get a bunch of attacks and repair, repair, repair. And those are going to be really brutal attacks. And you're like, man, uh, everything's more expensive to repair because we've upgraded it. And then you're like failing multiple attacks and bang burning like three resources per target on some of these because maybe your walls or your morale isn't the way you want it to be. It's problematic, but uh, I, I do think that these buildings really help uh, mitigate and reduce the, the chance of that even occurring. Additionally, it helps you just get the items that you want. Uh, notably faster, if you, especially if you want like, hey, everyone wants the spyglass and the crude chain and we're out of metal. Well, this will help you get the metal you need to at least uh, build up Frosthaven while still also using the metal that you collect to like craft on your own items. So I hope this uh, was informative to go over um, some of the decisions and early campaign for the buildings. I, I think at one point in time, I might run down some of the luck buildings, but I think I'm going to wait until people have had more of a chance to uh, jump into it and maybe do some more character guides in the interim. This, was, this video was pitched by one of the patrons. If you actually do want a voice and say, hey, why don't you do a video on X? Consider joining Patreon. Uh, we do have a link in the description. And again, the support helps immensely. Speaking of patrons, uh, thanks to all my Inox tier patrons for supporting the channel. Uh, you guys are wonderful. Uh, thank you for contributing some of your thoughts. I did think that this is a good topic to cover, and I'm glad I did it. I think this is going to... 
uh, be helpful for some people and or maybe just insightful for some people that may have already gotten through this part of the campaign or just want to hear someone else's thoughts. And I am more than willing to talk at length about anything uh, Gloomhaven or Frosthaven. So I hope at least if it wasn't helpful, you did find it very least entertaining. So thank you to our patrons. You guys are amazing. And thank all of you.